So today we're uh, going over clear cutting. And so with clear cutting, it's our first uh, even age regeneration method, starting off our regeneration method unit. And uh, we're gonna get into a few different aspects of clear cutting. And so we'll talk a lot today about the ecological aspects as well as the societal aspects. <clears throat> we won't get as much into the economic operational factors. Uh, we will go over the operations briefly. Um, but e economically, clear cutting tends to be pretty efficient. You're removing just about everything on the stand. Uh, so there's some efficiency there. So logging costs are about as cheap as they're gonna be for anything we do with logging equipment. Okay, so there it is again in the context of our regeneration methods. Uh, so it's intended to produce an even-aged forest, and it's really gonna favor shade intolerant species. And so here's our formal definition of clear cutting, and I've kind of highlighted some of the important points in there. Um, and there's a few things here that are easy to forget because of what we're so used to in our region operationally. And so we'll get into that a little bit. So if you want to get a definition of a clear cut correct on a quiz, uh, you need to say it's a regeneration method. That's going to be important. It's going to produce an even age stand. And then what does fully exposed microclimate mean? That's kind of technical. What's it mean? No what? Sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, no canopy. Okay, so no canopy. So we're pretty much removing anything that's going to produce shade. We do it all in one cutting, so it's simple. So you got a single cutting. And then it does say we remove all trees in the previous stand. And we'll get into that here in a moment, the difference between a clean cut and a clear cut. Operationally, we often leave non-merchantable trees and then handle them with other means, either mechanical or chemical site prep. So that all trees part, you know, could be handled a few different ways. So this regeneration is from part below that. That's what most of us, I think, uh, you know, misunderstand with what we see operationally in the South. Often it's easy to fall into the trap where we think it's a clear cut, it needs to be planted, okay? So clear cut trees, plant trees, clear cut trees, plant trees. And that certainly works, that's one option. But you can see there, there are three other options for clear cutting to actually get it to regenerate. You can clear cut a stand and think about this. Here in East Texas, if you clear cut a stand and you leave a patch of bare ground, is that gonna stay bare ground? No, something is coming back. We know it's gonna revegetate. It may not revegetate with species that we find desirable, but it is going to revegetate, okay? Uh, some of that may come from natural seed, and that can be seed that was in the seed bank prior to the clear cut, and that could be seed that comes onto the site after the clear cut. So often we think about clear cutting bottomland hardwoods in East Texas. We can get regeneration from either natural seed or advanced reproduction, but you can also get undesirable seed sources moving in. You get some flooding, Chinese tallow seed may float in, um, you know, so seed's gonna come from all over. What does advanced reproduction mean there? Yeah, so root sprouts are one example of advanced reproduction. The, the stumps that you cut, some of them will re-sprout. That's another example of advanced reproduction. Um, and then the third example is you may have already had some seedlings out in that stand, seedlings and saplings uh, that you have released with your clear cut. So if they were there before the harvest, that's gonna be advanced reproduction. And so then you've got a, a long sentence at the bottom there, but basically it's just saying clear cutting occurs at the stand scale, okay? And that's what distinguishes this from group selection and some of our other silviculture systems, where if you look at a, a group that's cut out, you can think of that as kind of a tiny clear cut, but that's not the stand. The stand includes that and all the mature trees around it. And so that distinction between what a stand is and what's just a smaller area within a stand is what really helps us separate clear cutting from a lot of our other regeneration methods. And so here's some examples of a commercial clear cut versus a clean cut. Um, and so in a commercial clear cut, you can see that example on the left, that's from Aspen up in the Dakotas. And you can see there's a few standing stems at the top of that ridge. Very commonly around here, when you drive past a commercial clear cut, there will be a lot of smaller stems that are stand standing that are non-merchantable that they didn't harvest, okay? Whereas a clean cut, we need to do that often for bottomland hardwood management in our region. And so with a clean cut, you want to cut everything down to even those two inch stems. So you're cutting the non-merchantable trees larger than four inches, and you're cutting most of the stuff that's in the two to four inch size range, which just isn't going to be merchantable regardless of species or form, because it's too small for most products. 
And so you're doing that for a reason. If you leave that mid story or that partial over story out there, you don't get the good regeneration of desirable species, namely oaks that we want in our bottom lands. And so, you know, you, you need to remove more. It's going to cost you more to log that. Uh, the logger, you know, is going to charge you more because they have to cut more stems, but it gets you your next cohort. So you need to do that. Okay, so another thing to consider that the photo on the right hasn't changed, but you see a new photo on the left. Those two stands look very similar. There's very little in terms of standing trees. There's down woody debris. You can see it's been piled in that photo on the left. And so this is getting at the idea on the right, it was a clean cut operation where they did it all with the harvest system. But on the left, what they did was a commercial clear cut. They left all the non merchantable stems, but then using mechanical site prep, they knocked down anything that was left standing. Uh, they pushed the slash up into piles. So you can do a commercial clear cut, not cut everything and then use mechanical site prep to still get you the same ecosystem structures there at stand initiation. Um, it doesn't have to be just mechanical site prep. You can also do this with chemical site prep. And so a very common thing that they'll do in industry forest today is those non merchantable trees. They ask the loggers not to fell them because they know they're gonna come in and they're gonna spray herbicides with a helicopter. So they're gonna spray those trees with a product like a Mazapir that's gonna kill many different woody species. They're gonna kill those standing trees, but it's gonna take a period of several years before they die all the way and then fall down. And so they're gonna be standing, which means when they go in to machine plant, and you saw a video of a machine planter on that spacing video, that's a small dozer, it can move around a little bit. And so when they go in to machine plant or even hand plant that stand, that tree is standing, it's not in the way. It literally is taking up what, like one square foot on the ground, whereas a stem that's down like that, now that small dozer may not be able to push right through it, it's an impediment. And so leaving them standing, it's actually just more convenient to plant around and there's not much safety risk because you're gonna plant within a year or two and those trees are gonna take longer than that uh, to die off and fall down. Okay, so here's a commercial clear cut. Uh, you may re recall this from the reading uh, showing an example where they left a bunch of pecan trees there, okay? Uh, so when you see standing trees like this in a clear cut, a commercial clear cut, if we assume the logger did a good job, which they did here, um, why aren't those trees harvested? Why'd they leave them? So one option is to leave trees for wildlife. Um, many of our large industrial forest landowners now are uh, SFI certified in the South. Wildlife is one component there they review for. And so often uh, as they do their periodic audits with the, the SFI folks, and it's gonna be the third party auditors, uh, not SFI directly. When they do those periodic auditor audits, often the auditors are asking, you know, are you gonna leave more wildlife trees? You can have perch trees for raptors, um, some benefits there. So it could be for wildlife. Uh, that's, that's a good theory. In this particular case, it isn't. So why else might they have, have left them there? Okay, so if you're leaving trees like that for natural regeneration, is that a clear cut? That, that would actually, that's a, a low enough density, that would probably be a seed tree, okay? And so functionally, this may look very similar to a seed tree regeneration method, where you're leaving a few trees per acre, they may be producing seed, but in this case, they don't want the seed from those trees to help with the next cohort. They just left them for another reason. So, so if you're doing that, just remember, don't call it a clear cut. If you've left trees to produce seed, to produce your next cohort, that is not a clear cut. So keep that in mind. So why else might they, they leave them? Yeah, it could help with aesthetics. That's one thing you can consider. Um, often it may, you know, it may not help a ton with aesthetics because usually the trees that they leave grew in a closed canopy forest. And then once you fully expose them like this, they're not the prettiest trees usually. Um, they've self pruned up a lot. And then the crowns often will go through partial dieback because the side of these crowns were used to being in the shade. So, uh, but you could leave some level of retention to help with aesthetics just so it doesn't look like a clear cut. So why, why else might they be leaving these? Yeah, so, so very commonly what you'll see is they're just harvesting the pine, they may leave the hardwood. Um, and so they may do that for a few different reasons. Um, in this case, you can kind of tell from the slash, this is probably a bottomland hardwood stand. So I don't think in this particular case there was pine, but that is a common thing to see. 
Um, it may be that they don't have a market for the product, that the product is non-merchantable. Um, so if they have a mill nearby that'll take pine, but they don't have a mill nearby that'll take hardwood, they may not be able to sell it, so they leave it. Um, it may also be that there's just not enough of it. And so, you know, if there's hardwood out there, but it's not enough to fill up a truck with, and you know, they don't have a whole load, they may not be able to haul that. So at that point, it may not be merchantable. Um, in this particular case, these were pecan trees in a bottomland hardwood stand, um, and they happen just to be not merchantable, okay? And that could happen for a variety of different factors. They may not have a mill near this stand that's, that takes pecan at all, and so that's why they're not merchantable. They may have a mill three miles from here that takes pecan, but for whatever reason right now, say this is in the middle of a dry winter, and in a dry winter, we have access to a lot more sites than we do in a normal winter. So if this is in a dry winter and you go and you look around, uh, or if this is in the middle of a hot summer where everything's dried out, you can access everything. Um, the mills may have all the wood they want. And so there may be a mill that takes pecan, but right now they're, you know, right when this logging is occurring over a one or two week period, the mill might say our, our yards are full of wood. We can't take any more right now, sorry. Um, and so in this particular case, it's not merchantable. Now, if they're up north, um, often what you see happen is they can fell trees and sort of stockpile them near the logging site, and then they can come back, you know, six, eight months later, maybe even a year or more, pick those trees up and take them to a mill. But if you do that around here, you know, we're pretty much almost always above freezing, and so rock processes are going to set in, um, and wood that's down on the ground will only last a certain period of time before it's no longer acceptable for the mills. So you don't see that happening as often in our part of the world as you might up north. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at this photo um, and you can kind of get a sense for where in the world this might be, what sort of species we might be dealing with, right? Does that look like it could be somewhere in the, in the southeastern US or even the western Gulf? Seeing some heads shaking no. I've actually seen some stands up in Oklahoma and Arkansas that look a little bit like that, not too dissimilar where you've got more topography. It does tend to be a little rockier up there. Um, there there's absolutely stands in the Carolinas and Georgias up in what they call the Piedmont region, the foothills of the Southern Appalachian Mountains that may look almost exactly like that. Um, in this particular example, that's actually lodgepole pine planted in Scandinavia. So Norway, Sweden, Finland. And so that just goes to show you that, you know, what we're learning here with clear cutting pretty much applies anywhere in the world where you want an even aged forest with shade intolerant species. And in that case, lodgepole pine is native to the Western United States. It's not even native to that region. So it's a non-native example there. So you can probably see Justin in the background on there. Okay, um, so you all were getting at, at all sorts of ideas around leaving some trees for wildlife, leaving some trees for aesthetics. So this is an example where you see that done um, in a boreal forest. So this is a boreal mixed forest um, in Northern Alberta, one of our Western Canadian provinces. Um, and so we often talk about our different silvicultural treatments mimicking natural disturbances, right? So a clear cut can mimic some natural disturbances, either a very severe fire um, or a very severe wind event uh, that may knock down most of the overstory in a stand. What's the major difference between a clear cut and a really severe wind event? Yeah, it's gonna be the downed woody debris. Um, and so when you clear cut, you're putting that on a log truck and you're removing it. And so here you can see they've left some level of structure to meet some other non-timber objective there. And so you can always modify these systems. That would technically be a clear cut with reserves. Uh, we'll talk about that next Thursday in class but that, that's perfectly viable if it meets your landowner objectives. Okay, um, here's an example where they've done a clean cut um, and it's kind of hard to tell from the photo uh, what sort of species that is, but this is actually aspen. Okay, so this is a poplar species, Populus SPP. Um, and this is actually in Hungary, so Central Europe. And so you can see they've done a clean cut there. So why would you be clean cutting uh, this poplar stand? Yeah, so one reason would be the ecological reason, right? So maybe the species, you need light to hit the ground so that they'll re-sprout if you're counting on root sprouting as a major mode of reproduction. So you always have to think about the ecology. 
Um, in this particular case, they didn't do it per se for ecological reasons. So really the difference between a clean cut and a clear cut is you're harvesting more of those small diameter stems. Think about things in the two to four inch size class. So why might they be harvesting smaller diameter stems? So in this particular case, in that part of the world, you know, you've got colder winters, you have a lot of wood burning stoves. And so exactly right, um, they use a lot of firewood there. And so with a lot of these small wood burning stoves, they want small stems. And so they have a market for the small stems. So they're harvesting them for operational reasons. They can make money on them, so why not harvest them? Um, and so if you have a market for small diameter stems, uh, you, you may be able to harvest them there. Um, so we have the biomass energy plan up here in the, the northwestern portion of Nagadoches County. Are they taking any wood today, Shannon? Oh, you don't work there anymore? Okay. Um, they may be converting over to natural gas anyway. Uh, but if, if you have a biomass energy plant that'll take uh, wood, small chipped wood, that may be another case where you've got a market for those small stems, so you can merchandise them. You're probably not going to make a lot of money on the smaller diameter stems, but if you can make more than breaking even, it may be worth harvesting. Especially if you need it for the ecology. If you're going to have to remove them anyway, you'd rather make a little money on them than lose a little money on them, right? So. Okay, uh, so here's another example. And so this is taken from Colorado. And so why in this stand in Colorado do you see that clear cut being so clean? Why, why have all the stems been removed? This would be really applicable if the question was about California right now. Fire, right? Um, and so we went on a silviculture instructor's tour a few years ago in Montana. Um, and we're walking through a uh, stand, logical pine, um, and we're looking around and there's a pile of slash on the ground and it's not a huge pile of slash. It's like 10 feet by 10 feet and the stems in it are two or three inches in diameter. It's sitting there. Um, and the folks leading the tour from Montana asked us, okay, so there's, there's a slash pile from the last time we harvested this. How long ago do you think we harvested this? And all of us from Texas and Louisiana and Georgia and Alabama are saying, eh, two years ago, maybe three years ago. Uh, it turns out that stand had been harvested a hundred years ago. Um, so if you get out into some parts of the world where it's colder and where precipitation's real low in that particular area in Montana, they were getting like 16 inches of rain a year. So it was about as low a rainfall total as you could get and still grow species like ponderosa pine or lodgepole pine. Um, and so you just don't have decomposition. So when you do a harvest operation, if you leave slash, that slash is basically going to be there until it burns because decomp is so slow. And so uh, many of these Western states will have laws in place. It's not just voluntary best management practices, but they'll have laws in place in Montana, Washington State, other areas that dictate if you do a timber harvest, you have to have a slash management plan in place and you have to do something with that slash. And it can be even more challenging in some of those areas because they may not have markets for those smaller stems. They may not have a pulpwood market at all. And so they have to incur the cost of doing something with that slash because if they don't, it becomes too much of, of a fuel's risk. Um, so you're talking about managing the slash, but you're also talking about managing the standing smaller stems, um, dealing with them as well so they don't become uh, ladder fuels eventually. Okay, uh, so here, who here has actually been out on a harvest operation? We've got just a handful. So I want to spend a few minutes just sort of going through a typical harvest operation. Um, I know many of you have uh, part of harvesting and processing uh, field station coming up here in a few weeks. I, I don't know if that's going to be mills or a harvest. We'll see. But I, I'm going to go through kind of a pretty typical operation for the south. Um, and then show you a few examples of some different systems you may see elsewhere in the world. But logging systems really vary regionally. Um, the different regions have different topography. Um, they have different uh, species compositions that will make different products. Uh, they have different types of mills. And so logging operations really vary pretty significantly depending on where you are in the country. So this is a typical operation for the south. And if you go talk to just about any logger out driving one of these machines in the south today, especially in East Texas, they're going to call that a shear. So that's a shear. And I'll show you a shear in a moment. They actually used to use shears all the time, where it's basically, instead of a saw blade there, um, it's basically just pinchers on the bottom. Uh, but we went to this piece of equipment a while ago, so the more technical term for this would be a sawhead feller. 
And so you can see that disc there on the bottom. Um, so right here on that photo on the right, you see that disc? That's a steel plate that's you know a couple inches thick. Uh, the hydraulics get it spinning, it's really heavy, and so it just keeps going. Um, it's got cutter teeth on it, and they can rotate the cutter teeth. Um, so as they dull, they can rotate them and get a new tooth up, and then they sharpen them. Um, it's, you know, thousand bucks or more for a set of cutter teeth. Uh, but basically when you hear these operating in the woods, you know, it's a big piece of equipment. So you hear the rumble of the engine going constantly, but then you hear it just going right through the trees, just wee, 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 right through the trees. So uh, it's going to cut them faster than chainsaw or anything like that. So it cuts the tree and then you can see it's got room up here on top of that plate. So it's got another plate above the spinning disc and the butt of the tree can just rest on that plate and it has grapple arms up here. And those grapple arms will hold it so that the person in there can move it around and set it down where they want to set it down. You'll see different types of saw heads depending on the operation. So you can see how this one in the photo on the right, um, it's got this off-centered area where they can hold a few more trees. Um, I took the photos of this one on an operation in Virginia where they were doing a first thin in a pine plantation. So if your trees are 40 feet tall and your trees average eight inches in diameter, they're not very heavy. And so this piece of equipment can hold, you know, five, 10 of them and set them all down and they can be off centered and it's not a big deal. But if you all have seen the kind of trees that are going into the Caltex mill we have here in town, a big sawmill where they may take a tree that's 24 inches in diameter. If you're cutting a 24 inch diameter pine, it's 100 feet tall and then are trying to set it down, you probably don't want it to be off center on your equipment there because <laughs> it would you know, tend to tip the equipment over. So you'll see different style saw heads for harvesting smaller trees in a thinning operation or larger trees in, in a final clear cut. Um, so this piece of equipment arrives on the site first and it works its way through the site dropping all the trees. Um, here's a shear. I got this photo up in Oklahoma. And so you can see the equipment looks very similar, but instead of having that saw head feller, now it's got the actual shear blades on here. So there's some pros and cons between a shear and a saw head. Um, these have an advantage if you're in rocky terrain, because you can imagine that saw head hitting a bunch of rocks. That's not good for it. It's going to dull it, it could jam. And so, you know, if you have someone with a saw head feller in rocky terrain, they may be cutting your trees real high. Uh, which you don't want. So you want them to cut them as low as you can so the stumps aren't a problem operationally as you try to get the next stand established and just because that's, you know, timber that's being left out on the, on the forest. So we, if you've got rocky terrain, a shear may be more advantageous. Um, with this though, as you can imagine, it's just a big pair of scissors. What's that going to do to the bottom log on the tree as it cuts it? It may splinter it, right? And so you probably don't want to use a shear on decent saw timber because you can damage that butt log. But if you're, again, if you're doing a thin, then it's pulp wood. If you splinter that butt log, it's not going to really matter. Okay. Um, so there's some pros and cons there. You'll see them around occasionally, but everything that everybody's calling a shear around here is usually actually a saw head feller. This is what an actual shear would be nowadays. Okay, uh, so here's a, a little bit sort of a, a different harvesting system. Um, and so often you hear people talk about shovel logging when they're referring to any sort of equipment that has like an excavator boom arm on it, like you see here. So if you hear someone talk about shovel logging, start envisioning a piece of equipment like this. Uh, but this has a pretty elaborate processor head on it. I got photos of this one operating in a stand in upstate New York. And so what happened, you can see it's tracked equipment and so there's going to be less ground pressure. It's less likely to disturb the soil versus wheeled equipment. Um, up north, they can also harvest in winter because then the ground's frozen and it's very difficult to compress or compact frozen soil uh, or to sink the equipment in it. So they'll do a lot of harvesting in the winter up north. Uh, but what this could do, this could go up to a tree um, and those two studded drums there that you see, um, they would open up so they were wide enough that this could be placed vertically up against the tree. You had grapple arms up here that would go around and, and hold the tree. And then basically down here at the bottom, it's hard to see, but down here at the bottom, there's a big chainsaw. And the chainsaw just come out, cut the tree, go back in where it's out of the way and isn't gonna get damaged. Um, and then the, the logger here will direct the tree, direct the fell of it, land it on the ground. And then what this does, many of our harvest operations in the South were used to cutting tree length. 
So they'll actually, you know, fell the 40 foot tall pine trees in the first thin, they'll drag that whole tree back to the log deck. Um, but when you do that, you're dragging the whole top of the tree. So it's impractical for larger trees. Um, and there's gonna be some level of soil disturbance. And another downside is the small twigs, the branches, the leaves, that's where all your nutrients are. So if you can just leave those dispersed throughout the forest, that's good for the soils. Um, and so what they actually do here, this is a cut to length operation. And so they drop the tree, then these drums start spinning and they'll actually drag the whole tree through that processor head. The grapple arms that were holding the tree up while they were logging, that pops the limbs off. So that delimbs the tree. And then the operator can just hit the button again and the chainsaw comes back out and cuts it to length. So now you have a log out in the woods that's been you know, delimbed and it's got whatever length log they need for that particular product. And so completely different operation. Um, here you see some other examples of shovel logging. Um, so this photo on the left um, is what they call a, a dangle head feller. And so there aren't a bunch of hydraulics here on the joint between the, the feller head um, and this boom arm. And so it's kind of like one of those games with the claw where you grab the stuffed animal where they just kind of got to swing it and it's all about the motion of the arm. And once you've got it swung just right, the saw head sort of flips up and they can put it on a tree and they can cut the tree. And so uh, it's cheaper piece of equipment, easier to maintain than if they had all the hydraulics to control that saw head uh, very specifically. The downside to it is if say you've got two trees really close together, it's gonna be a lot harder for the operator to cut one without damaging the other. Um, so it takes a lot of technique, but they get pretty good at it. It's an efficient harvest system. So I got the picture of that one out in Oregon. And again, you can see it's tracked equipment and they're used to working on steeper terrain out there. They've got a lot more terrain. And so the cab of that will do what the cab on the one on the right will do. I didn't get this picture on the right, um, but that's an example of a, a harvest system in Chile where you can see those tracks are on about a 45 degree slope, but the operator in that cab is level. And so they can work on pretty steep slopes. So I've seen an example of that sort of shovel logger on the right. I've seen one out in Montana where they just run straight up and down a real steep slope. They can harvest everything around there um, and then at the top or bottom, they can kind of turn around and make another pass and harvest everything they can reach. Occasionally, you'll see shovel log setups like this, um, where the cab mostly stays level in the south. Uh, but in our region, we don't have much terrain on the coastal plain. Uh, but what they are useful for with that tracked equipment in the boom arm is you can do swamp logging operations, where you can harvest sites where if you send in the wheeled equipment, they're wet enough, it would likely get bogged down, it would run up your site real bad, you might lose the equipment. Uh, which you don't want to do. So this, this shovel logger set up with the tracks, it's less likely to sink a little bit, but they can also fell smaller trees and pulpwood and drive on top of them and then reach all the timber around there with the boom arm. Whereas the saw head feller I showed you at first, it's got to drive up right up to every tree. So you will see equipment like this sometimes in the south for logging some of our wetter sites. Uh, they're, they're getting even more sophisticated on how they log some of these steeper slopes. And so often what they'll do now is they'll park a big dozer at the top of the hill and they'll put a big winch on it. And then they'll run a winch down to the feller. So on the photo on the left, you can see that big heavy duty chain uh, tying that uh, shovel logger up into the dozer at the top of the hill. Um, they'll do this with skidders too. Um, and some of them are uh, like this example on the right is robotically operated. So they can actually control the winch from the logging equipment. And basically they go down the hill, they do what they need to do and then they drive up the hill and the dozer helps winch them up the hill as well. Um, and so you may hear this called a number of different things, tethered logging, um, one that's pretty common. So that, that's becoming more and more common on steeper terrain. Okay, so all that's just how you cut the tree down. That's not how you move it around at all, that's just felling the tree out in the woods. So once you've felled it out in the woods, you need to move it around. Uh, so this piece of equipment is called a forwarder. This is not something you commonly see in the south. Again, because a lot of our operations are tree length. Um, that photo on the left was from that job in upstate New York where the processor head cut the log to specs and then they went out there with this wheeled forwarder, the grapple arm picked up the log, set it on the bunks there on the back and they could bring it back to the log deck. Um, so the photo on the right shows you the same idea but tracked equipment. Uh, so you're not gonna see that around here. You'll see these up north often. Um, it's very typical to have harvest systems like this in Europe. Uh, but not, not in the U.S. South. I don't think I've ever seen a forwarder in the South. 
This is the most common thing you see in the south. It's a grapple skitter. Um, so they could be tracked, but they're almost always wheeled. Um, and they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You can see some examples of uh, grapple skitters now. Uh, you know, these photos are showing you a smaller one with four tires. They've got them with eight tires on them now, just massive pieces of equipment. Uh, but all this does is it goes out, it grabs the tree, it drags it back to the log deck for processing. Uh, they'll have little, uh, you know, dozer blades on the front so they can do other things. They can push down small trees that may still be in the way. Um, they can do a little bit of work, you know, if you need a little bit of dirt moved around. So they, they can do a few other things. We used to see a lot of cable skitters where they would have cables like that hanging out the back. Uh, but these were less efficient because the operator would have to get out of the equipment, choke up the log, get back in the equipment. Whereas with a grapple skitter, you can operate that from all in the cab, grab the trees. So these were less efficient, but because that operator's climbing in and out dozens of times a day, it's also a lot less safe. Uh, so logging is still one of the deadliest jobs in the country and in the world. So anything we can do to make it safer is going to be a good thing. So you may still occasionally, rarely see someone out with a real old uh, skitter that's got cables on it. Okay, so there's some other completely different types of harvesting systems you'll see out west on really steep slopes. Uh, these are less efficient, more expensive. So they only deploy them on the really steep slopes where they can't do anything else. Uh, but this would be cable yarding, cable logging, a uh, few different names for it. But they basically erect some sort of tower at the top of the hill. Usually at the bottom of the hill, uh, they'll attach to a large tree. Um, that large tree, they may go up at 50 feet, somebody with a chainsaw will climb it and then top it, fell the top out of it, and then, you know, hook all the cables and everything up to it. But, but you have a steep slope here, so you actually have people walking up and down that slope, felling all the trees with a chainsaw. So that's going to be really dangerous. And then you have other folks that go down and you can see this uh, little cab that runs on the cables up there uh, towards that tower on the left. But it runs up and down the hill along the cables and it hangs a few cables under it. So you have other people going up and down the hill and they take the logs that have been, the trees that have been felled, the logs that have been felled, and they put a choker around them and hook it up to this. And so the person that may be at the top of the hill that's running this up and down may not be able to see all those people down the hill, which makes it even more dangerous because they're dragging logs up the hill. They can't see when the log has fallen off it and there's people down around all that. So a, pr a pretty dangerous harvest system, but it's the only way to harvest some of these really steep slopes out west. Okay, so once you've felled the trees and once you've been able to move the trees, you take them to some area. You commonly hear these called sets around East Texas. Same thing as a deck, same thing as a landing all different terms for an area where you do most of the processing of your trees on a harvest operation. Um, you can see in the bottom left of that left photo, uh, they actually have a bunch of wood mats down. So they'll commonly use crane mats in these areas. And that's just because, you know, you have log trucks driving through here. You don't want them running up the soil, but you also don't want them getting stuck. Uh, it's gonna slow them down. It's a pain to get them out. So they'll commonly put stuff like that down just to make that deck area work pretty well. You want the deck area to be flat. You don't want it right by a stream, just so it's easy to operate on, but that's good to keep sediment out of our streams. Um, and they really, they don't want to skid a log too far. So you may need multiple of these landings set up per harvest operation. Uh, so really you're not looking at a skid or skidding logs any more than a quarter mile. And the, the shorter the skid distance is often the more efficient the job's going to be. Um, so you may need multiple of these per logging job. But the, the skitter brings the, the logs back, and then that piece of equipment on the left is often called a loader. And in this example, what that loader is doing is it's lifting the trees, um, and you can kind of see out this, the far end of this boom arm on the loader. So it's got the grapples here on the end of the boom arm, but then it's got this kind of rail here, and out here at the end of that rail, it'll have some pincher jaws. Basically, it's called a CTR but they'll put the tree in there, they'll drag it through, that'll pop all the limbs off. And as that's popped all the limbs off, it'll have a chainsaw that can come out and cut it to life. Okay? Um, and then they load it on a truck. If you have pulpwood, you're harvesting a lot of trees per acre. So with pulpwood, you have to delimb a lot of trees per acre because you can't have all the limbs sticking out of the log trucks driving down the road. And so I've seen uh, chain flail delimbers uh, on operations up in Oklahoma. I think some of you in intensive civil culture, we may have seen one. Um, and that's basically this big box, and it's got an axle in the middle of it, and that axle's spinning, and it's got just chain on it, big chain. 
and they stick all the trees in there and that chain just breaks all the limbs off and it can shoot them up to like 500 feet. Um, but it's efficient on a, you know, large number of trees breaker basis, like a first thin where you may be harvesting 200, 250 trees uh, per acre. So you delimb them, you get them cut to length, you put them on a log truck there, and then the log truck has about 28 and a half tons of wood around here in East Texas, and it'll drive them to the mill where they can be unloaded. So those three main pieces of equipment, the feller, the skidder, and the loader, who's gonna be the most important in your harvest operation to getting your prescription implemented correctly? Is it the person driving the feller, the person driving the skidder, or the person operating the loader there? So both, yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, world, you've, you know, got good people on everything, right? But, you know, if you've got, you know, some people that are good, medium, and, you know, maybe beginners here, where do you want to put your best person in a harvest operation? So the feller, why the feller? You can't put back a tree. You can't put back a tree. Okay, so it's silviculture, so we know the answer is always going to be it depends, right? So you can't put back a tree. So what type of operation is the person in the fellow the most important on? Thinning, right? So when you're thinning, you don't want to cut too many trees and you don't want to cut the wrong trees. And you don't want to damage the trees that you leave. Um, if you get someone that doesn't know what they're doing, it's very easy to damage a lot of the trees that you've retained to grow to the end of the rotation. So absolutely, in a thinning operation, that person in the fellow is going to be real important, okay? But think about a clear cut operation, you know, you're not worried about damaging the trees that are left because you're not leaving any. And, you know, your instructions to the person are go cut down all the trees. Okay. So in that case, who's going to be the most important? At the end processing, why? Exactly. So that person in the loader at the end is doing your sort. Um, so on a simple operation, you may have three different mills that are accepting a product each. So you have three sorts. On a complex operation, you may have 13 sorts where you've got three products going to one mill, two products to another, one to another. And this person needs to know, here comes a tree. They need to be able to look at that tree and they need to be able to look at it and say, if I cut it to this length, I can send it to that mill and that's going to make me more money than if I cut it to this length and send it to that other mill. So that's called merchandising. They're merchandising. it, And so this person will make or break the, the operation for the logger and the landowner, really, um, on a clear cut operation. So it depends on the operation. Of course, you know, ideally you want good people in all these pieces of equipment. Um, so when you get to the mill, this is a photo I took at a mill in Oregon that could cut. This was a crazy sawmill. They could cut boards like 110 feet long. Um, someone actually built an arc in Kentucky. This was the mill that cut the timbers for that huge arc that they built as a tourist attraction. Uh, but it was kind of funny. We were there watching this. They would actually unload these dug fir logs and drop them in that pond. Then they have these little tugboats that would drive around um, and bring them to the, the sawmill. Uh, but if you look at that truckload of wood, you can see it only has six logs in it. So we're not used to that in the south. But if you look down, you can also see the tires are a couple feet off the ground. Uh, so we, we were watching this for a while where they had gotten the logs stuck in there. Uh, so they're taking that loader and trying to get them off there. And I guess the, the guy in the loader was just picking up this log truck and shaking it, just the trailer, not the cab, but just shaking it, hoping it would drop off and it didn't. And then after a while he got out and it looked like his dad hopped in and was trying to <laughs> see if he could get him out of there. Uh, but yeah, so different parts of the country, different challenges with these harvest operations. Okay, uh, so that's a, a little bit on harvest operations. So I want to shift gears now, talk a little about the ecological impact of clear cutting, because we hear a lot about that. Um, and one of the main things we hear with the ecological impact around clear cutting is going to be erosion. So common sense, if you cut down all the trees, you can get a lot of erosion. So that seems pretty intuitive, I think, for most folks. Uh, but in the real world, it, it doesn't turn out to be that simple. Um, so here's three photos. It's a time series. So spring 2001, there's a clear cut. Fall 2001, four months later, it's revegetating. Three growing seasons later, it's revegetating. So is there much potential for erosion three growing seasons after a clear cut in the south? Really, no. Okay, the other thing to look at here 
this is not like a good operational clear cut. Um, they cut almost everything. You'll rarely see that much removed in a clear cut operationally, but then they didn't appear to do anything to revegetate it. There's no new seedlings or anything out there that you can see that are apparent. And so even if you don't do great silviculture in our part of the world, it's gonna revegetate pretty quickly. Other parts of the world where it's not gonna revegetate as quickly, you could have more of a problem. Um, when we first started coming up with forestry BMPs, a lot of that in the South arose out of a hydrologic research station that the Forest Service has in North Carolina called Coweta. And here's a study they put in in the 70s. And Coweta's neat. It's, uh, it starts at, I think, a thousand or so feet elevation. And then the top of it's up at about 5,000 feet elevation on the Appalachian Trail. So this is Western North Carolina. But they have 30 or so watersheds that, you know, have bedrock under them. So they're discrete watersheds. And they have put dams at the base of each of them with a weir in it. So a V-notch where they can, you know, constantly estimate the flow of water out of them. And they have data going back like 100 years on these. And so this is a forested system, Southern Appalachian hardwoods, and they've got some white pine out there, all sorts of species. But they've been able to do all sorts of different studies on their watersheds and then track the sediment and water that come off them. And so they put this study in in the 70s and they basically, on an experimental basis, they were able to clear cut right to the stream. Okay, so they went in to put in this study where they clear cut to the stream. And what you're seeing on this graph is the cumulative amount of sediment coming off that stand because they could measure that. Um, and when they went to put it in, what they saw is they actually got almost all their erosion coming off of road building. Okay, and this is a steeper part of the country, steeper terrain. So that's, you know, you're building a road in steep terrain. And then they got a couple major storm events and you get that huge pulse of erosion before they even started logging, okay? Then you can see there's slight upslopes from the logging, but really it's that road building and the storms that are causing the vast majority of the erosion. So we'll get to this when we talk about BMPs later this semester, but our clear-cut harvest areas are not where we get a lot of our erosion. Roads are where we really find a lot of our erosion, and when you look at a BMP manual, it reflects that, where a lot of it talks about roads. This is data from uh, Dr. McGroom's dissertation. And so he uh, looked at uh, different studies around here where they thought they were seeing pretty high erosion rates coming off right after clear cutting um, in some areas and were kind of wondering why. Uh, so he went in and looked at that, but this is just one figure from Dr. McGroom uh, where this is data during Tropical Storm Allison hitting the study. And so that would have been, you know, that, that was, the storm that when Harvey was coming through, they kept comparing it to Allison. So this was a high rainfall hurricane and then tropical storm. Um, and so when you look at that, basically the, the x-axis there, it's only a two hour time period. Uh, but during that tropical storm, you see lots of water coming off the watersheds he was studying and the sediment load picks up as well. And so we can't control, you know, our heavy rainfall events around here, whether it's a hurricane or a tropical storm or if you'll remember, I think it was like 2015, some random day in, I think it was uh, October, Corsicana gets like 39 inches of rain or something. So we get these crazy rainfall events around here. You have no idea when they're gonna hit. They're very unpredictable. So if you happen to have just done a clear cut and then you get something like that, you may have potential for high erosion. So um, we do everything we can to revegetate quickly, but really you gotta focus on roads and stream crossings more than anything, because that's your greatest potential for erosion. Of course, it's a very different story out west and other areas where you have much steeper terrain. So that's kind of a complicated looking graph because it's got these different logarithmic scales on it. And it's showing you a couple different axes for different variables. Uh, but what that very complicated looking graph says is the steeper your slopes get, the more likely you are to have a landslide and the bigger it's gonna be. So no real surprise there. Um, so in the US South, when we think about our land use history, we basically, timbered the whole south so we cut almost all our trees back in the 17 1800s and then we came through we converted it all to agriculture and then different events happened we had the civil war in the 1860s and that caused a lot of land that was in agriculture to go back to forest the people that have been farming it were killed during the war um, and then you had periods like the great depression when people who were out managing marginal soils for agriculture they were barely scraping by before and then the depression hits and uh, they ended up not being able to farm that land anymore. So you had pulses where there was a lot of abandonment of agricultural fields and that's where our forests are today. 
So most of our forests in the south were already cut over long before we started practicing real forestry. And due to poor agricultural practices before we knew everything we did today about agriculture, they would run plows right up and down the slopes. And so you would end up with a whole bunch of erosion. So you hear varying reports, but southwide, some of them we may have lost a foot of topsoil uh, before we even really started on what we know as forestry today. So, you know, when you clear cut something in the south, you know, that's not going to be the major source of erosion. Out west, on the other hand, you know, by the time they settled this, you know, uh, they're, they're not really getting into heavy logging until the 1900s. Many areas, you know, the original forest uh, wouldn't have been logged out until the 1960s, 70s, 80s. You've got much steeper terrain. So there are numerous examples out west where they're doing some timber harvesting on steep slopes. And then you do end up with a big landslide and it, you know, they can bury whole towns down in the valleys. Um, it, it's very difficult to say exactly what that relationship is between timber harvest and that landslide occurring because you'll get landslides without the timber harvest. Uh, but there's lots of lawsuits going on in different cases trying to link those. But uh, so that clear cut area and how you handle it can make a big difference out west potentially. And then your roads are going to be really important out west because you've got these roads on this steep terrain you put those in the wrong place, engineer them incorrectly, and you may have a lot more potential for erosion. So erosion may not be a huge risk on the Southern Coastal Plain uh, with clear cutting, but in other parts of the world, it may be more of a risk. So you always got to adjust to where you are. Um, this is a photo I got out in Oregon where they had cable yarded this uh, system. You could see the Pacific Ocean if you went up on top of that ridge, it was about 10 miles away, uh, but they had cable yarded it. Uh, and some of those slash piles were absolutely enormous. Uh, bigger than anything I've seen in the south. They might have been 20 feet tall and 30, 40 feet wide. Um, but they were reforesting this with uh, Sitka spruce and uh, a number of other species. So steep slopes. Uh, but if you look at this steep slope photo, look at all the slash that's still well distributed around that area. So even on that steep slope, if you've got that slash down, that keeps a rain droplet from causing that soil grain to erode. Uh, and detach. So if you've got a lot of slash, that'll help minimize erosion. Yes, I So on those slopes, would they burn those slash piles? Would they redistribute them? Um, they're definitely not redistributing them. Um, I, I don't know if they were going to burn them or just leave them. Um, I, we didn't see any burning when we were out there, but we were only out there for a few days, so it might just not have been the right time. Yeah. Um, they have major aesthetic issues with clear cutting out there. We'll get into in a minute because, I mean, there's no hiding that. You can leave an aesthetic management zone by the edge of it, but it's on a mountain slope. You can see that for miles, so. Okay, uh, what I wanna wrap up the end of class here with is just thinking a little bit more about the societal aspects of clear cutting and sort of how we've gotten to where we are today and some of the things you hear about clear cutting. Um, so I, I could have picked the Bitterroot controversy from out west, but here's the Monongahela uh, controversy from uh, West Virginia. And so you can see there's the Monongahela National Forest, pretty large, National Forest uh, in West Virginia. They've got Eastern White Pine, Hemlock, so some gymnosperms. They've got, you know, lots of Appalachian hardwoods. And so what they did, this was way back in the 60s, uh, the Forest Service had a bunch of research. Remember the Forest Service was established in 1905, so they'd been around for quite a while by this point. They had a lot of data and they had figured out that they had been doing some partial harvest here, so kind of something like a shelter wood, but they had figured out if they clear cut, it would meet all their objectives better. Okay, uh, they had data showing them it was going to give them better timber volume, it was going to give them the trees they wanted rather than less desirable species, and those trees would be better quality. They had data showing this would be better for wildlife than what they were doing, and so they had lots of data here showing that clear cutting was going to work. Um, but they didn't think about the public, they didn't think about that societal aspect of silviculture. Um, they didn't think about aesthetics very much when they were going over this. And so they started putting these clear cuts in, um, in this steep mountainous terrain like you see there, where everyone lives down in the valleys for the most part. Um, and from those valleys, you can see those mountains from pretty far away. And keep in mind, this is mid 1960s. So there's still people alive there. The old timers were around when the Forest Service was established in the early 1900s and in that period in the late 1800s. And if you'll remember why the National Forest System was established in 1897, and then why the National Forest Service was established, we were worried about running out of trees at that time. They had logged everything, just over-harvested, didn't know what we were doing. 
Um, so, and there were big concerns with water quality. You were seeing major flood events in areas that hadn't had them before because those forests weren't there regulating the, the watersheds anymore. Um, and so you had floods like the Johnstown flood in Pennsylvania that just wiped whole towns off the map, even though that one was from a private dam on a resort failing. But uh, so the, the old timers are, you know, seeing all these clear cuts going in and thinking, oh, we've been here before, this isn't good. Um, and so some folks get together, they sue uh, the Forest Service back based on that Organic Act. Um, and basically the way the Organic Act was written, it said they had to have mature trees and, and clear cut you don't for a period of time. Um, and so the, the lawsuit went through and basically as the lawsuit was ongoing, Congress decided to respond. And so they started putting some new acts together that would fix issues with this now 60 to 70 year old Organic Act. And so they put out the Resource Planning Act of 1974. It had some issues with it. So they put out the National Forest Management Act, NIFMA in 1976, which actually amended that Resource Planning Act. Um, and they, the laws allowed for clear cutting provided it was scientifically sound, but they, along with uh, the National Environmental Policy Act from 1970, they really built in a lot of public input into the whole management process on our national forests. Um, so under NIFMA now, our national forests need these 50 year management plans. And when they go to revise them, update them or create them, there's lots of different periods of public input, town halls uh, that go along with that. So they really went from management by experts with prescriptions to management by consensus uh, with a lot of public input. And so, you know, they basically had clear cutting shut down from 1968 to 1978 as all this worked its way through the courts and the legal system and new laws were created. And so it was shut down for about 10 years. So think about that, any gypsy moth outbreak, insect disease, fire, anything going on, they couldn't really do much to help mitigate that with harvesting in that period. So not ideal. Um, and they came up with some common sense stuff that's very similar to things we'll see in certification when we talk about that later this semester. Uh, don't do a clear cut that's more than 25 acres. That gets you what you need ecologically, but at the same time, it's not you know, too big that it's this big aesthetic problem. Make sure the clear cuts are at least an eighth mile apart. That way you don't have people saying, here's a 25 acre clear cut and here's one right beside it and here's one right beside it. Just so you don't have people you know, getting around the, the rule there with a the loophole. Don't make these things squares or triangles or anything weird like that. Put irregular boundaries on them so they're not as visible. Um, and then wait until they're at least 20% of stand height before again, you cut beside it. So again, just trying to cut off another obvious loophole of putting too many clear cuts that are small right beside each other. And so we, we saw these big differences between public land and private land in terms of all the different laws and regulations that apply depending on what land you're on and whether those laws require direct uh, impact of the public. So public land, you've got a, a lot of societal stuff you've got to focus on. Uh, private land, you have some things, Endangered Species Act is still going to apply. You've got voluntary best management practices. Uh, even a private landowner managing timber, that there's a lot of stuff that goes on with how the, their taxes affect what they may do. And so that's, of course, regulated under federal and state laws. Um, large corporations can be affected by the public, uh, especially nowadays with social media. So there's still different societal things you're going to need to think about on private land. But with clear cutting, let's, let's start thinking a little bit about some of the perceptions on clear cutting. So go, go ahead and let's take some votes here. So I, I Google image searched clear cutting a while ago. So there, there's some options there. Who, who thinks the picture that came up with a was a hippie and a toboggan hugging a stump? Nobody likes hippies and toboggans. How about massive saw wielding robot felling trees? Nobody? Actual clear cut? A few hands up, some optimists. Shoeless children leaping at a field of stumps. Okay, got some fans of shoeless children. And then uh, Native Americans in traditional garb leaping at a field of stumps. Few votes there. Fortunately, it is an actual picture of a clear cut. But, okay, uh, you start looking through the different image search results that pop up. Here's uh, Oregon, the clear cut state. So that, that pops up for out west. There are actual saw wielding robots cutting down trees. Uh, you dig into this a little bit more. First off, you'll notice another one in the background. So apparently you need two of these out on this harvest operation. This is a one foot tall prototype some engineer in California has built. So all that logging equipment we looked at isn't good enough. You need robots out there doing this. 
Okay, and then you look further. So on the left here, here's a cartoon. On a clear-cut day, you can see forever. So this cartoon is blaming species extinction, soil ruination, whatever that is, uh, fires, floods, all sorts of other stuff on clear cuts, uh, even though there's not much data to support that. And then on the right, I've attempted to get this. It's only available in VHS. I don't have a VHS player anymore and it was out of stock anyway. Uh, but, but here's a, a movie with Graham Greene in it called Clear Cut. Um, and if you read that, I think it says a, a wilderness as menacing as deliverance. Um, and then the other byline is, what is it right here? It's small, I can see, but, uh, yeah, they're destroying the land of this heritage, now they must pay. So there's another perception on clear cutting. Okay, here's the Sierra Club from California. And if you look at what the Sierra Club from California has to say, they're ascribing, uh, let's see, what is it here? So clear cutting is apparently harming water quality, forest health, and communities throughout the state. And so I, I don't know where they're coming at there. Usually clear cutting supports logging and industry, which supports communities, but apparently not in California. You can see the little graphic there too. They have a very large deer and a very large maybe rabbit there, about the same size as the trees. Uh, but they cherry picked a picture of a clear cut that you know may not look the best. And so just keep that in mind with clear cutting. You know, Clear cutting and herbicides are the two things in silviculture that may kind of give us a black eye in terms of the public really not understanding what we're doing. So uh, depending on where you work, who you're working for, just keep in mind clear cutting uh, you know, may have some issues in some parts of the country. So, any questions on clear cutting? <laughs>